baptized and witnessed the baptism of Sandra Regan. Uh, Sandra and Jack are members of the community here. Um, baptism by water is the symbol of one's union by faith with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. It constitutes the public confession of these spiritual realities to the world and is the answer of a good conscience towards God. <clears throat> Baptism is administered to those who have been born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and who give evidence of the genuine, genuineness, I knew I'd stumble on that, of their salvation. So Sandra, if you come up, we're gonna read a little bit of scripture that we picked out especially for you today and uh, yeah so there this is from Ephesians there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called and one Lord one faith one baptism one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all got four scriptures to read here this one's special to Lonnie. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. <coughs> As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both he and Philip, well, both Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip was baptized. And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, all of whom the Lord our God will call. And the last verse I want to read, just being elusive here. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to them and said, <clears throat> All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey, I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. We ask Lonnie and Dwayne to come. Come up. Yeah, yeah, you can get in there, step in. Hopefully it's not too cold. <laughs> So, Sandra, is it your desire today, Sandra, to be baptized as a public confession of your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the author of your salvation? I do. Then, in that case, Sandra, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Baptism, isn't that great? Praise the Lord. Bless you, Sandra. That is so thrilling. Yeah, it's a privilege for Teresa and I to be back here again. Uh, it's uh, great to see your faithfulness and steadfastness in the Lord. Uh, great to see some new faces and, uh, yeah, to hear good things and uh, just uh, delighted to know you're shining here and it was glad to encourage you in that. Uh, when it comes to spring, uh, it just feels good and you think about getting baptized, that's like new life. Uh, and what a great reasons we have to celebrate this morning as we gather here. 
Uh, I've got a text for us from Isaiah 64, so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there, uh, if you would please, Isaiah 64, uh, in your Bibles. Uh, it's uh, in the Old Testament there, kind of a little bit past the middle probably. Isaiah 64. And uh, the prophet Isaiah, as you know, prophesied uh, during uh, uh, the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, when you think about uh, the, the nation of Israel, you probably know that, uh, of course, uh, God promised Abraham what? I'm going to bless the whole world through you. I'm going to give, uh, uh, you're gonna, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to be a blessing to the whole planet. And of course, the Messiah came from him. But what happened, first of all, was uh, through Abraham's seed, uh, the nation of Israel was born. And uh, of course, they were in captivity in Exodus, we read. Uh, and then God saves them and brings them into the promised land. And what do they do in the promised land? Well, they got the Ten Commandments on the way there. Uh, and they're to live by these commandments, uh, which really reveal who God is. Uh, and uh, by revealing who Jehovah is, they bless the nations, they uh, bless the world. Uh, uh, did they do a good job of it? Well, it was pretty dicey, really. Uh, God sent his prophets regularly, remember? They went into idolatry and worshipped the gods of Canaan. Uh, and then they'd come back and God would send them some more prophets. They'd make th another prophet, they'd make things right. And so it was a real up and down uh, deal. And finally, in 586 B.C., uh, the Babylonian army came down and swept out into Jerusalem uh, and uh, uh, destroyed the cities, destroyed the temple. And you'll get the picture here even when you read about this, even in reading this text. So that's kind of the context. And so now the children of Israel are in Babylon and they were captives there for 70 years, of course. So this is Isaiah writing during the Babylonian captivity. Uh, can you stand again? Uh, and we'll read the word of the Lord if you don't mind. Uh, Yes, Father, would you open up your word to us, your living words uh, to dying men and women, boys and girls and teenagers. <coughs> Feed us the bread of heaven, we pray. Uh, use whatever is of my lips that's of you uh, to feed your people, and whatever is not, might they soon forget. And might indeed we be caused to live afresh, even as uh, baptism is the witness that we're alive in you. May we know the power of the resurrected Christ upon us as you feed us with your truth, we pray today. <coughs> Amen. O oh Lord, he says, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your known name to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, which of course is what they did and brought this judgment on them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strive to lay hold of you. For you've hidden your face from us and given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We're all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are called all your people. Your sacred cities have become a wasteland. Even Zion is a wasteland. Jerusalem is a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple where ancestors praised you has been burned with fire, and all that we have treasured lies in ruins. After all this, Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? The word of the Lord. Please be seated. So can you remember as a kid uh, going out and playing and uh, uh, playing uh, so intensely that you just lost track of time, riding your bike around town or whatever it might be. I remember, I remember doing that. I was a great fun. I remember uh, I was raised uh, with three brothers a couple hours north here on the shores of Lac Saint Anne, uh, and uh, we were all lean and lanky and very muscular. Uh, at least that's what we thought. Uh, and uh, uh, we liked to pretend we were monkeys, and so we had a fair bit of bush on the farm. So we'd go out there, and we'd have a lot of fun, particularly, with, for example, with, with trees. I mean, you could climb trees, of course, and everybody wants to get to the top of the tree because that's when I mean, you're accomplishing something, right? So we'd climb trees or we'd switch trees because once you get up there, 
if, if things were right, you could actually switch to another tree. And that was a great lot of fun. Uh, or else, uh, we'd bomb trees. It worked really good if you had willow trees. We had a lot on the farm there. And so you'd get up some willow branches and then you couldn't make it fall down to the ground. But if you had a couple more uh, bodies up there, you could. And so that was uh, just part of the fun we had as kids. And we had such a blast in there. Poor mother, good thing she's still alive. Uh, when you think about it, sometimes we play church. When I was little, Ann Ortland says, we used to play church. We'd get the chairs into rows. We'd fight over who'd be the preacher, vigorously lead the hymn sing, and generally have a great carnal time. The aggressive kids naturally wanted to be up front directing or preaching. The quieter ones were content to sit and be entertained by the upfronters. Occasionally they'd be mesmerized by a true sensationalist crowd swayer, like the girl who said, boo, I'm the Holy Ghost. But in general, if the upfronters were pretty good, they could hold their audience quite a while. If they weren't so good, eventually the kids would drift off to playing something else, like jumping rope or jumping jacks. Now that generation has grown up, but most of them haven't changed too much. Every Sunday they still play church. They line up in rows for their entertainment. If it's pretty good, their church may grow. If it's not too hot or if it's too hot, they'll eventually drift off to play something else, like yachting or wife swapping. How can we keep from playing church? Well, I'd like to suggest to you the first verse of our text there describes the solution. Oh, how big is your O? Oh, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might flow at your presence. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the manifest presence of God. It challenges us to hunger for God, to thirst for God, to be in awe of God, the great and awesome God he is. Just like Jesus challenged us in Matthew 5, verse 6, he said, blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. The invitation is for us to hunger after the manifest presence of God. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Is there more of Jesus for you uh, than you have today? Does the Holy Spirit have more of Christ to reveal to your soul than you know today? Certainly he does. There's more, there's more. That's the good news of the gospel. And my goal and desire here in our short time together is to invite you to hunger uh, for the presence of God in a new way. To hunger personally and then also corporately as a body, as a community as well. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, uh, our Lord, in his book, The Weight of Glory, he said, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. And so the invitation here is to hunger for the presence of God. Uh, I'm not talking about the omnipresence of God. We probably all heard about the omnipresence of God. You know what omni is, right? Anybody remember the Dodge Omni from 1978? It was the car of the year, apparently, according to Motor Trend. We had a Plymouth Horizon, which was the same thing. Uh, it was a total lemon. I think probably the Omnis were too. But the idea was the Omni was everything. It was all, right? Because that's what the word Omni is, refers to all, right? And so when we think about the omnipresence of God, it means that all presence of God, which is just an absolutely beautiful thing. Uh, and what a thrill for us as Christ followers to be able to live in the manifest presence of God. As Psalm 139 says, Oh, God, you've searched me and know me. You know all about me. You know my sitting down, my rising up, my walking. Uh, such knowledge is just too wonderful for me to behold. Everywhere you are, I can't be away from your presence. I can't be lost uh, to you. And so it can be very comforting. It can be very disturbing, of course, if we're not uh, living and heeding that uh, presence. But it really also can be a, a surprising, rich thing for us because sometimes we just don't expect God to be uh, wherever we might uh, be, for example. I love the story of, uh, of Jacob. He's on his journey back to Haran to find a wife. And it's a long ways going. And, uh, and remember the story about him uh, having to fall asleep, having a dream there about the uh, ladder to heaven and the angels coming and going. And, and this is what he says uh, when he uh, wakes up. He says, uh, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't aware of it. Isn't it marvelous? You just can't get away from the presence of God, even though you think maybe uh, you are. The good news is he is omnipresent. He is there, but 
what Isaiah is talking about here is not the omnipresence of God, just the all presence of God, as awesome as that is. He's talking about the manifest presence of God breaking through, changing things, uh, which is a very different thing than uh, the omnipresence of God, because Christ's presence breaking through brings renewal, it brings hope, it brings power, it brings life, it brings revival. And you know what the word revive is, basically? It's just two syllables long, right? Re plus five, and re is again, right? And vibe is life, and so it means life again, having that life again, discovering life in Christ again. And I dare say that really, when you think about the Bible, it's really a whole string of stories about God's manifest presence of God, God revealing Himself over and over again, whether it's in the Garden of Eden or to Abraham or to the children of Israel or uh, to the prophets uh, or in Christ Himself uh, in the church uh, today, all the way through. I mean, look at the, what. How does it end here? In Revelation 21, this is what he says. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And so you get the picture right from Genesis, God in the garden with the children of Israel, or with Adam and Eve, right to the very end, and what? They're God's people, and God is with them. It's all about the manifest presence of God. And in between, we have these stories. Of course, sin came in and perverted everything, but still today, we're in that time span between Genesis and Revelation, right? And that's where uh, we're living uh, today. And so he invites us to experience his presence. And what does uh, the psalmist say in Psalm 16, 11? In your presence, what? There is fullness of joy. Because God is all about the fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Can you imagine? The presence of God. Well, that's what Isaiah is praying for here. Oh, God, tear the heavens apart. Come down, make yourself known uh, to your people who are languishing and in deadness. What did he have in mind when he said mountains? May the mountains be moved, he said. Uh, was it, were those literal mountains? Was that what uh, uh, Isaiah was praying about? Or uh, were they figurative mountains? Well, the key, as you know, of course, is the context. What's the context there? Well, if you still got your finger there, it's pretty easy to see what the context is in verse 3. It says... Uh, and when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. So it's not really figurative mountains. He's talking about literal mountains, right? And what was a literal mountain? Well, uh, it's looking back uh, to uh, Exodus, uh, where the law was given. Remember Exodus 19? Uh, do yourself a favor, go home and read it this afternoon. It's just a richest story about the presence of God coming uh, down the mountain upon the people. I'll just read you a couple of verses from it. Uh, verse 9. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud so the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. And so he went and told the people this. They got themselves ready for three days. And then what do we read uh, in uh, uh, verse uh, 16? On the morning of the third day, there was thunder. Imagine this. And lightning with a, very, uh, with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet brass. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it. The smoke billowed up from it like a smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. You've seen some pictures of smoke, uh, fire burning even this past week. I mean, imagine uh, what this would be like. And the whole tr mountain trembled violently. And, and although that's what he's looking back on uh, when he's praying, God, do this again, reveal yourself. Now, for you and I, it could be figurative mountains. It could be mountains of sin, right? It could be mountains of self-righteousness, could it not? Or uh, self-justification or self-glorification or the mountain of P-R-I-D-E or the mountain of bitterness or the mountain of resentment. It could be all those things uh, that we're inviting God to come and change in our lives personally or corporately. Think about our country, Canada. Uh, think about our culture we live in. I think about the mountain of humanism or the mountain of consumerism, or the mountain of secularism, or the mountain of perversion. I mean, they're all idols. I mean, what's the idol in humanism? Well, man is God, right? What's the idol in secularism? There is no God. And what's the idol uh, in perversion? Uh, immorality is God. What's the idol in consumerism? Well, basically money and stuff, things are God, right? Because uh, idols just come in so many forms to our lives, uh, but they always overpromise and underproduce because they're not God, right? They're just idols, they're just crap that we get suckered into. And so it could well be a great prayer for us personally, right? Oh God, rend the heavens and remove my mountain of P-R-I-D-E or my mountain 
of selfishness and self-seeking. Now, as you think about it, do we have any stories in church history of God rending the heavens and come down? <clears throat> well, I dare say there's story after story. If you want to do your soul a good thing, you can go home this afternoon and just Google uh, The Role of Prayer by Dr. J. Edwin Orr. The Role of Prayer by Dr. J. Edwin Orr. He's basically the, probably the first revival historian and he tells incredible stories there. I'd just like to relate a couple to you. Uh, when you think about God coming down and rending heaven and moving mountains of sin. In the 1790s, America was in a major moral slump. There were 300,000 confirmed drunkards and a population of 5 million people. Women were afraid to go out in the streets at night. Bank robberies were a daily occurrence. In the wild frontier of Kentucky, things were even worse. There wasn't one court of justice held in a whole five years. The decent people formed regiments of vigilantes uh, to fight for law and order. They fought a pitched battle against the outlaws, and they lost. In 1794, Isaac Baptist, a pastor, sent out a plea for prayer, and the next five years, almost every church in the country were down, begging, calling on God uh, to intervene. And in the summer of 1800, the Kentucky Revival began, and it spread across uh, Kentucky and the whole U.S. And here's some of the outcomes. Besides the many, many who were born again and entered the kingdom of God, the modern missionary movement was birthed. The abolition of slavery was thrust forward. The popular education movement began, and some 600 colleges were founded by the revivalists. Why? Because the manifest presence of God broke through and changed the culture. Living in Bowdoin, uh, you probably appreciate your police officers that make their way through town once in a while or are around. Uh, could you, would you feel better if there was more police officers around? We might well feel that way, right? It's natural. I know we'd feel that way uh, in Silver Lake. Now imagine what it would be like if we actually didn't need any police officers. Or we needed a whole lot less of them because uh, people were policing themselves. Before the Welsh Revival of 1905, much moral corruption uh, promenaded Wales, and Evan Roberts, a young coal miner turned Bible school student, I uh, addressed a prayer meeting of 17 souls, saying, I'm compelled to tell you a word from God. Uh, and this word from God uh, was basically had four points to it. And so he told this prayer group, number one, uh, confess any known sin to God and make right any known uh, thing that you've done wrong to man. Number two, put away doubtful habits out of your life. Number three, obey the Holy Spirit promptly. Because, of course, in Acts 5, verse 32, what does he, he say? He says that, the Holy Spirit is given what? To those who obey Him. Every step of obedience you take, uh, you can expect the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh. The, the obedience of baptism is happening. That's the step of obedience. You're going to expect the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh. Uh, you might sense more spiritual battle, but whatever it is, every step of faith you and I take, the Holy Spirit is there to empower us, to live within us, and to live that out. And what did Jesus say? He said, if you fathers being evil know how to give good gifts, uh, to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him, to those who invite Him to come in, those who invite Him uh, to take control, because the Holy Spirit will respond to your invitation when your hearts are open to Him. So the first thing He said was, confess any known sin to God and make things right with men. Number two, put away doubtful habits out of your life. Number three, obey the Spirit promptly. And finally, number four, confess your faith in Christ publicly, which of course is what baptism in two is too. So by 10 p.m. they'd all uh, done that, but the next, the next what, night, because they were just so uh, revived by the Spirit of Christ and the uh, openness of their hearts, and they met the next night, and they kept on meeting, and within two weeks, uh, the spiritual revival broke out. And at that time, as you might expect, uh, police had two main functions in town. One was to prevent crime, and number two was to go with the crowds and went to the football games. But after the revival, uh, they had an emergency meeting of the regional council because the police were out of work. There was nothing uh, for the police uh, to do. I mean, there was no rapes, no murders, drunkenness was cut in half. One police sergeant was asked, uh, what do you do with uh, your officers now? He said, well, we've got 17 members at our station, he said, and uh, between them, uh, we've got three quartets. So whenever uh, one of the churches wants a special music, they just phone the police station. <laughs> because people are policing themselves, because the Spirit of God was flowing high, because he had rent the heavens and come down and responded and answered to prayer. Some of you probably heard about the Asbury uh, 
Kentucky Revival just back here in February uh, around the University of Asbury there. And to me, that might, you might not call it a full-blown revival, but it's definitely a mercy drop as far as I can see. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jeff Gowdy, who actually moved to Central Alberta basically to invite church leaders to pray for revival, and he's got like 10 prayer groups going here around Red Deer. Uh, a friend said, well, I'll pay for your way to go down there. Uh, so we went down there and he said, uh, the best description of it was, is like you're kind of here, it's like if you were walking in, in, the, in the bottom of the ocean and you just got this, uh, just everywhere all around you, he said, it's just the presence of God. Uh, particularly he said, the peace of God, the shalom of God is just, it's just permeating everything. He said, uh, and that's the best description uh, he could give, give of it. Or some of you, anybody watch the Jesus Revolution movie? I don't know if you've seen that one. Uh, but what a thrill, 50 years ago, remember the bell-bottom pants wearing those things? Yeah, that, you know, that was, the, and yet the Jesus people came out of it, because there's all these young people uh, looking for identity, looking for belonging, looking for purpose, just like young people are looking for today. Uh, but they couldn't find it in the consumerism of their parents, and so they went to uh, drug, sex, rock and roll. But in the midst of that, uh, God saw fit to uh, save a whole whack of thousands and thousands who responded looking for uh, what God had, and it makes you pray, Lord, do it again, because it's such a thrill to see what happened. And today we still, we have a, a whole generation of young people again, searching for meaning, identity, and purpose. But our world isn't offering it. But what does Jesus offer? Meaning, identity, purpose, hope, which is really what any one of us and every one of us is made for. I don't know if any of you have ever heard about the Saskatoon Revival in 1972. Anybody hear about that revival? So that's 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, I like to think of myself as a product of that revival, actually. Uh, what happened, apparently, was uh, in a church in Saskatoon, a couple of brothers hadn't spoken to each other for years, and for whatever reason, uh, they had some special meetings or something. These brothers uh, confessed their sins to each other and made right, and it just went like a fire uh, through the whole church, and, and basically the church in Saskatoon, a whole whack of believers were just made alive with Christ. And what they did is they sent out teams and uh, one of those teams came to Onaway Baptist Church, uh, near where I grew up, where I went to high school. Uh, and, uh, and so a number of people from our congregation went there. And uh, five people in my home church in Alberta Beach uh, got revived. They just, they, they had that new life. They were revived in Christ. Uh, uh, and one was a pastor and his wife. I think he pro probably wrestled with pornography, but anyhow, he got things right. And another, a couple in the church that got things right and my mother, she just changed like, uh, I couldn't believe it. Like she tells a story about uh, uh, wanting to sit down and watch her soap opera, but the spirit was so present that she just knew the spirit was grieved when she did that. So she just put it aside and focused on surrendering to Jesus. And she was just changed. And so anyhow, I'm, uh, I'm basically gonna graduate that year. I, I did high school in five semesters out of six. So the sixth semester, I'm just hanging around home, working at the service station and waiting for graduation and I'm gonna go to uh, university uh, and so during that uh, semester I'm sitting in on these prayer meetings as I worked afternoons and I can just see the reality you know as a teenager you can just tell a phone or you can tell reality right and it just hooked me uh, and I was tempted to say yes to Jesus you can have all I am but you know I had this crazy fear in my head I thought well maybe you send me to Africa you know you can have those crazy fears right you know they just got to keep you from what, what you should do uh, and so yeah no way uh, but then the whole thing came to the head in May 1974, uh, a van load of us teenagers went down to the Kingdom in Seattle, and Bill Gothard was doing his seminar on basic youth conflicts down there, uh, and there were like 17,000 of us, and he's talking about how to live with a clear conscience, how to live uh, in a healthy way, getting rid of bitter, bitterness, anger, uh, how to respect authority. Uh, it, it was just transforming. I never thought following Jesus was supposed to be this practical. I thought you just went to church, you just played church, right? You, you just, uh, uh, that was just kind of what you did. You were saved and you went to church. And so just, uh, just came, uh, so finally at that uh, conference, I surrendered my life to Christ that week. Uh, and that was my defining point. And after that, I decided, man, I'm not gonna go take mechanical engineering. I'm gonna uh, go to Bible college and, uh, and get into this, you know? And, and that's really was basically uh, my call. And I'm so glad that God uh, did that for me. Now, why do I focus on this verse to tell you those five stories? To whet your appetite for two things, remember? for you personally and for you, us corporately. Our, our, our renewal, a desire for renewal in our own hearts and a desire for renewal uh, for our province, our country, 
that we live in. And so uh, when you think about your personal time, I invite you when you have your quiet time uh, tomorrow or today uh, to consider, is there more of Jesus than you have today? Oh yeah, invite him to rend the heavens and come down, reveal himself in a new way. How big is your, oh, 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 I need you. Oh, I hunger for you because those who hunger and thirst uh, will be filled. So the psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God. I don't know about you, but I have the hardest time practicing solitude, right? Your mind just kind of going, you're just out, you know. Uh, but just keep at it. Keep at having that hunger for God. Those set aside times uh, to experience Him, uh, to know who He is, and to love Him with your whole heart. I just heard a podcast recently on love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. And uh, I said to the Lord, I said, What do I need to do to love you more? Uh, and you know what he said to me? Uh, it might surprise you, but it might not. He just said two simple words just dropped into my head. Uh, you know what he said? He said, stop scrolling. So why do I scroll? Well, I'm looking for a connection. I'm looking for some belonging, uh, some identity, uh, some value. And what's Jesus want to give you? You want to give me? Does he want to give me connection? Does he want to give me belonging? Does he want to give me identity? Does he want to give me value? I dare say, beloved ones, that's exactly what he wants for you. He wants to be your belonging. He wants to be your identity. He wants to be your purpose. Because he's the one who's designed you and called you and made you his very own. He doesn't want me looking at Facebook, not there's anything wrong with scrolling like that, but how much do we scroll? Imagine how great, how healthy your soul might be if you just put away your phone for one day a week and fast, had a phone fast. Because his invitation was, don't look at Facebook, look face to face with me, face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what can it be? When in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Think about his attributes, and that's what I've been trying to do even as I've had this quiet time since. <clears throat> Every one of them is like mind-blowing. I dare say you could probably spend all eternity uh, getting to know his faithfulness, or his holiness, or his justice, or his love. What does uh, Paul say in Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 3? He said, I pray for you that out of God's glorious riches he might strengthen you with power through his spirit and inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you might be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. And so the application for you and I is how hungry are we, are we for him? Oh, would you rend the heavens and visit my soul? And I'd like to invite you, just as we have a quiet time here in closing, just to respond to that. Do you believe there's more of Christ than you're experiencing today? Respond to him. I invite you to bow your heads with me and your hearts and just tell him that you're hungry for him and say, Oh, God, would you rend the heavens and come down and reveal yourself afresh to my soul because I need you. I'm hungry for you. Or practice what Evan Roberts said to those 17 people. Confess and you know and sin to God. And make things right with a fellow man. Or put away doubtful habits. Or obey the Spirit promptly. Or confess your faith in Christ publicly. Let's take a quiet moment. Just respond to him. Uh, telling him that we're hungry. That we want more of you. Christ, we perish for lack of you. We desperately need you. Cleanse us afresh, forgive us afresh, wash us afresh. And we marvel at the glimpses of you you've given us, Lord Jesus. We think about your beauty, which is beyond description, that you're marvelous for words. May you 
feed of us, feed each of us as our souls hunger for you uh, this day and this week in new ways uh, to experience you, uh, to know you afresh, and to know that you are good and you are great and you are gracious and you're really our belonging, our identity, our purpose, our all in all. Thank you for the privilege of living in you and you living in us. We bless you. Amen. As I said, I'd like to invite you to hunger more for him personally, but then to pray corporately that God might be pleased uh, to visit us afresh, visit you as a church afresh, a family afresh, a town afresh, Central Alberta afresh, uh, Canada afresh. So I'd like to invite us before the closing song just to join in prayer with one other person and pray, God, would you rend the heavens and come down in a new way in my world, in my church, in my community, uh, in my country. Uh, and, uh, and just consider even one other person, maybe this next week, that you could pray maybe over the phone, a brother or sister in Christ, uh, and pray that God would uh, rend the heavens and come down. Or maybe a small group you can be part of. I heard you got prayer meeting. I invite uh, God to revive your souls, revive uh, your church, revive uh, uh, Bowdoin, revive uh, Central Alberta. I'm part of actually three different uh, are two different uh, men's groups that pray for a revival, and it's a it's a great thrill. Uh, and I'm trusting uh, that God would hear. Uh, and, and you look at our country, and we're in a moral slide. We're, you don't need to tell you that, right? Uh, and we need uh, the Holy Spirit to revive the church, uh, that we'd be uh, indeed His witnesses. And one of my great joys is I believe that uh, God has people hidden away, solitary figures that are praying and calling upon God. Uh, and my hope is that uh, as we call upon God collectively, that indeed he might rend heaven and come down and uh, change the whole culture of central Alberta here where you and I live in, in Canada. I think about our beloved country, Canada. I mean, we're looking uh, for a political savior, right? We're looking for a moral savior. Uh, we're looking for an economic savior. But the fact is there's only really one savior, and his name is Jesus. And he's uh, the one... We need and we need his presence because his presence is really the only spiritual life we have and it's the only hope for our country because second chronicles 7 14 is still in the book and what does it say it says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face then i will forgive their sin uh, and i will heal their land and so uh, i invite you uh, even before we leave now uh, we're going to have a closing song but i just invite you to neighbor nudge with one other person or maybe maybe three sins, just a neighbor nudge two people, and just pray that God would open up the heavens, that he would reveal himself afresh uh, to our community and our country, if you would please do that.